Good morning. It's good to be back at Cottonwood Church. Um, some of you know that for a number of years now, I usually come two, three times a year, sometimes in the summer, but uh, this summer didn't work out so well, so I'll be here, and then in a few weeks, I'll be back. And if you forget this message, I threatened I'm going to do it again, just to let you know. <laughs> a few weeks ago, Pastor Matt and I, uh, Matt, I gave him a tour of the remodeled Kelvin Seminary building, and I just sat down and talked. Uh, it's always appreciative of his ministry. Appreciate you. I know he appreciates you. Appreciates the time for him and his wife to be able to have this mini sabbatical. And especially, um, I just want to say, you know, I go to a lot of different churches. And I just want to just say, it's always, always good to come here. Um, there's ways that I would just say to you, and I mean this in the best sense of Genesis 1, this is a good church. You know, when, when God created, there's this moment where he says, and saw it was good. So when I see a, a Pastor, staff, council, congregation, new year, welcoming new people, hearing about people stepping up in service. I just want to let you know, um, it's good. And so thank you for what you've been able to do. I usually do give a little bit of an update because I know a number of you are not only interested in what's happening at Kelvin Seminary, you're interested in what's happening through Kelvin Seminary in terms of the ministry um, we send out usually sometime in the beginning of January a, a card that we create usually in our in terms of our chapel. A few years ago we did Zoom boxes because we couldn't gather together. So this past January we sent out a card that had everybody in mask except for this one student who pulled it down so you could see their face. I know that student. We talked about that. But um, in the back of the card where he says, uh, join us in our call to be witnesses and ambassadors for Jesus. There's a list of countries represented. And so this past year was this. Um, Argentina, Australia, Brazil. In fact, a recent PhD student just became a pastor in Byron Center um, in the CRC. Canada, Chile, China. I uh, met a new student from China this past uh, summer. Colombia, Costa Rica, Cuba, Dominican Republic, Guatemala, Japan, Kenya, Mexico, Myanmar. I have a student right now who's from Myanmar, uh, who's taught for eight years but wanted more, and so she came to Kelvin Seminary. Nepal, Nigeria, Singapore, South Africa, South Korea, Taiwan, Tanzania, Uganda, United Kingdom, United States. That's quite a list. You don't have to... At, the, at Kelvin Seminary, the world actually is coming and we then get to bless the world. I hope to even make a trip to Indonesia where there's uh, three seminaries that are led by people who went through Calvin Seminary. And what country is not listed? Well, Ukraine. But this past summer, a person who was involved in ministry in Ukraine connecting with George Device to uh, resonate of, of part of the CRC desires once again for more training. So he, his wife, and his daughter are in Grand Rapids, and they're just getting started. You can imagine all that's on their heart. They, they want to know and be with people that they minister with and to in Ukraine. But maybe this is a time for them to just go deeper in different ways for hopefully their return and hopefully for expanding ministry as ambassadors for Jesus Christ. So when you think and pray about Calvin Seminary and and I really, once again, always appreciate um, follow-up conversations. Sometimes I'm down here. Sometimes I need to get that lemonade, you know, that, that's there. Uh, that we have the opportunity to just talk and connect about what God is doing through us at Calvin Seminary. And I'm, once again, grateful for what God is doing through you here at Cottonwood Church. Let's open our hearts before God again, shall we? Dear God, we live in a world that goes very fast. And because it goes very fast, it doesn't always have the opportunity to look up, to understand a connection with you. In fact, if we look all around us, we see people who are struggling with the pace of life or the stresses of life. The school year has begun, but Lord, once again, there might be that someone who hasn't yet found a friend on the playground. Or there's a new college freshman who's not quite sure if what they plan to study is really what you're calling them to do. And then there's someone who just got a medical report 
or they're still dealing with the effects of something that happened that brought a level of grief to them this past year. Whatever that is, God, we lay this before you and ask that you would once again be present through your word, by your spirit, to help us see you, hear you, and trust you. In your name we pray. Amen. It was on June 2nd, 1953. Wherever you were, you might have tried to find a television set. 1953, television sets were not as prominent as they are obviously today. Not even as big as today. But this was a global event. It had already happened a year before in terms of this person coming to this position, but now was the formal part, the coronation, if you will. And because of the timing, this was the first time this event could actually put on, be put on TV and then televised throughout the world, and all people were watching to see this young woman step forward and take the vows to be head of state, head of the church, Queen of England. Queen Elizabeth II, that was her time of coronation. And many of you have been following the events of the last few weeks. Maybe you were surprised like I was. The queen meets the new prime minister and then just a few days later dies. And you and I maybe followed a little bit of the pageantry, those silent vigils by first the children and yesterday the grandchildren of Queen Elizabeth II. And then tomorrow we'll be able to watch. And again, it'll be a global event. People are there to watch this passage and this service, this memorial service for the queen. And one of the things that we saw was people standing in line, standing in line, even if you didn't see it, David Beckham, this famous soccer star, he was in line. He had a hat on maybe to avoid some people notice him. And then people asked him, how long did it take you to go through? I stood in line for 13 hours he said, to fall by the casket of the queen. And I still remember kind of hearing one person say, you know, that they had been there like 20 hours. And they, they asked, uh, the reporter asked, well, why did you stand for 20 hours? And the person said, she was my queen for 70 years. I think I can handle 20 hours. And what's kind of interesting of the last kind of this kind of event, especially um, those in England, but it seems to have affected a lot of us, is how things slow down and there's a pace. They were not hurrying through the streets of Edinburgh. And even though there's this solemnity, you could hear the, the horse's hooves on the pavement. But we all know that after this event happens, when Tuesday comes, you move on. And people will not have the same set of pace, or maybe we'll call it rest. And so this morning, I want to start with a reality that will be, be what we have been seeing in sort of slowness of time, willing to stand in line for 13 hours or more, is not usual. In this world, we actually have something else going on. Like clickers not necessarily working right when you want to. All right, I'm trying. It's on green, and we just changed the battery. The lights are red. There we go. Thank you. Is it you or me? It's probably you. Yeah, it's you. <laughs> Remember we talked about this? You're on. <laughs> So in a world of striving and struggle, where do we find rest? Now, this morning, there is an outline. It's going to focus, and we're going to walk through Hebrews 4. But we, before we get to that text, I want to take us through some of the themes. Like, one of the themes of Hebrews 4 is this phrase called Sabbath. Now, growing up, Sabbath meant for me these two words. Stop or don't. See, if I try to do that, then you can do that. There we go. All right. See, this is how we're going to communicate. 
Usually this clicker works. I just want to let you know. I want to shut it off and turn it on again just in case. But growing up, this word Sabbath, when you read it, it had different connotations for me, especially as a young person, to stop or don't. I especially remember growing up that there's this moment where um, I'm on the farm, Fulton, Illinois. Many of you know I grew up in Fulton, Illinois. I was a lawyer in Florida, but, you know, pastor in Chicagoland area. But um, I grew up in Fulton, Illinois on a hog farm. And we had this basket hoop right next in terms of the barn, you know, and right there, that's what we did. And uh, Sundays were kind of exciting if my relatives could come over, especially my cousin Jim, because he liked sports, I liked sports, so we would actually play basketball together. And it was a Sunday, so we had to get permission to go outside and permission to actually say we would like to play basketball. And here's what my Aunt Hilda said. My Aunt Hilda said, you can play, but you can't sweat. <laughs> for, for her, it was an idea that once you started sweating, that's like labor, that's work, I guess, and somewhat like that. All I can tell you is we were glad it was a cold day. We were not sweating. <laughs> Whatever. But, uh, you know, I grew up, and some of you maybe grew up in a similar time, that you just didn't do things on Sabbath. So Sabbath wasn't like a really... An, you know, encouraging words some way. It meant, again, don't or stop. Like one of them was, we did not watch TV on Sundays in our household growing up. But somehow, there was this particular day, April 16, 2022, that at that particular day, I convinced my mother and father that they should let me watch TV. I don't know, maybe it was my lawyer skills coming out. I don't know what it was. But on that particular day, I watched television, and then I gave the report. Mom, Dad, you won't believe it. The Chicago Cubs were playing the Philadelphia Phillies, and the Cubs won. Now, that's amazing by itself, I think. But what's more amazing is that was the fourth start of a pitcher by the name of Bert Hooten. And on that day, that key date of April 16th, 1972, he threw no hitter. I'll never forget that day. Never forget that day. And so I decided to make another push in terms of the argument for my parents. I said, so see, God really wanted me to watch TV. <laughs> see what happened the following week. So I say some of those stories because maybe that helps you understand too that we need to have maybe a refreshment and renewal of what Sabbath actually means. And what the writer of Hebrew wants us to understand is the Hebrew writer wants us to know about and trust in the solid foundation for rest that will last, a rest that is eternal, which is also present for us today. Now, one of the things that I'll say related to that rest that is eternal is that I saw, maybe you did too, some of the signs that were there for Queen Elizabeth, lots of flowers, but one of those signs might have said, as I saw a few of those, R-I-P, rest in peace. And I stand before you, I've been here before, so I, don't, I, I just feel like sh I can share with you that this past month, August, on August 3, my mother died. On August 20th, my wife's mother died. We have stories related, as you might imagine, for both. And I still remember on one of the Facebook posts directed to us as we shared, someone just simply said, R.I.P., rest in peace. Where does that come from? Where does that phrase come from? Is it just limited to something that's in the future for those who die? Or is there something more that we can experience today? That's the question. Now, Hebrews 4 begins with this word, Therefore, this word therefore. So what is there before this passage? We're going to look at all of Hebrews 4. And in your outline, it has kind of the end of Hebrews 3. And again, this is in your outline, not on screen. So if you, but you can, I'll, I'll basically read it to you that what is there before this passage is this from Hebrews 3. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those that Moses let out of Egypt, and with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the desert, and to whom did God swear that they would never enter, here's the key phrase, his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. 
The writer of Hebrews, and he writes similar to the Apostle Paul, but you don't see his name anywhere there. He basically saying, I know that when I come to talking about Sabbath, I need to help you understand that you don't find rest because of disobedience. And there's something special about this rest. It's his rest. It's not just a day of the week. It's not just like for us, many of us who are in the Christian tradition, it's not a Sunday. In the Old Testament tradition, it's not that Sabbath. It is something more. It's deeper. And so from that, in Hebrews 3, there's this reminder of Psalm 95 and the remembering of the rebellion on the way from Egypt to the promised land where there was going to be a different type of rest. See, when you're in Egypt, you're a slave. And you work when people tell you. And if you're not working hard enough, they whip you. And you're always on call, if you will. And then there's the promise of God's rest in this promised land. And, and the writer of Hebrews isn't just saying, well, now let's go back to that time of Exodus. He's saying it's also part of a reality today that many times we are still bound in Egypt, the land of sin. We're a slave to sin and we're on a way to a new land. What is that land like? Well, there's images about that, and we start with the image of Sabbath. So Hebrews 4, and once again, it'll be on your screen as we read through this. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed enter that rest. Just as God said, so I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. And again in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God set a certain day, calling it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For Joshua, the person who actually led people into that promised land after Moses. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. And how do you know when something's disobedient? For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who is ascended to heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. That's the end of Hebrews 4. But there's a lot obviously there. Hebrews 4 notes the introduction of Sabbath at creation. At the very beginning, God had a design for the creation, and we are included in that creation. In fact, an old phrase in theology as we humans are the crown of creation. And he saw us and saw all of this and said, this is very good. Genesis gives us a picture of this cosmic rest that is both joyful and satisfying. God looks at all that he made and says, wow, wonderful. And he says to us, enjoy. And he invites us to enjoy. And what we did is we twisted what was going on. 
and we turn from the goodness of this joy of creation, the depth of that rest was shattered by sin. More specifically, this rest was broken by disobedience and distrust. Now, there's elements of other stories involved in Hebrews 4. There's obviously the element of the story of Adam and Eve who, when that moment came, said to Satan, maybe you're right. Maybe God didn't say it the right way. And as a result, that sin shattered that world. And they were barred from the type of rest. And you know what happened then. The the consequences of sin came not just to them, but to all of us. You're going to work. There'll be sweat when you're harvesting. Childbirth, oh, there's going to be pain. And we have seen pain and sorrow and brokenness ever since. Then there's the story of coming out of Egypt, going to the promised land, and kind of in the background of Hebrews 4 is this moment where they knew what was right. They knew what was right, but then when they're about ready to enter that promised land, those 12 spies who went into the land, if you read that story, they all say it was a wonderful land. Ten of them, though, said there are giants in the land and we're just like grasshoppers. And they turned away, even though God had said, I will give you this land. And instead of proceeding forward and moving in, they disobey. They don't trust God enough. They don't trust God enough with protecting them and providing for them as they enter into that promised land. And so they turned away from the promises of God. But Hebrews 4 doesn't stop with that struggle and those losses. Hebrews 4 also points toward a picture of a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for those who die in this life. And especially for myself this morning, thinking about my mother and my mother-in-law, and maybe you're thinking of someone right now in terms of their life. And I know because I've met some people here who are no longer here because they're with Jesus. You want them. You want them to have this sense of assurance that there is resting in peace and they find their rest in Christ. But the reality for us who are here this morning is that all there is. I want to give you a real pointing to the promises of heaven and the wonder of it. One of the things that, as I kind of did some background, was thinking through, what are people who were thinking about heaven? And one of the stories that struck me was a story about a famous composer who most of their works was composed after they become deaf. And so you can imagine, they're creating orchestral arrangements and they're there, they're conducting, but they cannot hear the sound here on earth. It's only in their heads. At age 27, Ludwig Beethoven began to go deaf. But the last words of Ludwig Beethoven is this, I shall hear in heaven. Whatever struggle we have here on earth, and there are struggles. And so yes, there's a wonder about cancer being completely conquered. Or people who always were struggling with their mental health, finding a level of healing and belonging that that you and I can't even imagine. I Maybe mean, we can imagine Ludwig Beethoven hearing in heaven. But what do we do today? Is the gospel just for the future, heaven? No, the gospel is for us to live by today. So what do we do today? And this morning I'm just gonna quickly go through five things that I think are rooted not only in the passage, but it rooted in terms of the understanding of us and this flow of scripture. You probably were struck like me. How many therefores are in this text? It all comes together. It all is connected. So here's a pathway for rest. Let's start with number one. Expose, reveal sin by scripture. Moving from surface to the heart surgery of the sword. That's where we began this morning in terms of that confession moment. Understanding that right in the midst of Hebrew 4, between Sabbath and Jesus is the high priest, there's this passage about scripture that says, you need to know. A lot of the world is oblivious 
because they don't know the scripture. They don't know that God actually can see it all. They don't understand that there's something going on, not just about what we do, but how we think. And so if you really want to find rest, you're going to have to undergo surgery, a surgery of the heart. And part of that surgery, and you saw in Hebrews 4, this word coming up again and again, disobedience. So it's a repenting, a moving from disobedience to obedience. Number two in terms of this list. The moving from disobedience to obedience is a journey. It doesn't happen all the time just in one day. There are going to be days that you're going to understand you repented, but there's a continual life. Hebrews 4 is instructing people of how to live life today. There's an emphasis on this word today. Therefore, God God said a day, calling it today. There's something about the urgency of today coming to a day of repentance. But also in terms of how do you do that, you do that when you come to someone to confess, who you're to confess to. In the Old Testament, the scriptures might have had this, we're going to have a day for a corporal day, a day of repentance, and we would approach the temple. We would approach the high priest who's symbolic of representing Christ. So we approach the great high priest who knows our temptations and can be trusted with remaking your hearts. See, the writer of Hebrews wants to avoid two things. What does Adam and Eve do when they sinned? They try to cover up. They try to hide from God. What do the people of God do when they're on the edge of the promised land? They turned away. And they turned from what God was preparing for them. Hebrews 4 says, no, no, no. Don't hide. Don't turn away. Approach. Approach the great high priest. I don't know if I want to approach the high priest. Why? Don't you know who that high priest is? Don't you know that that high priest understands you? And that you can trust this high priest because there has been this continual promise from God ever since the fall that he's going to work for renewal of creation. Ezekiel 36, verse 26 says this, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone, which doesn't work, by the way, and give you a heart of flesh. Now, I think that you and I would say, "I, I think I understand. That's kind of understanding of like even the basics of the Heidelberg Catechism that we need to know our sin and know our misery and then approach Jesus Christ and then to live a life. But I think what this passage, Hebrews 4, helps us see is this is a continual journey. Number four says this, keep approaching God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And the reason I quote from verse 16 is this, I think when you hear the phrase, in our time of need, when is that? Is that a one and done thing? What are your needs for today? But do you have needs for Monday, Tuesday? What I think happens in the Christian life sometimes, and even for people who come to church regularly, is we go, well, this is the time that I give God my needs on Sunday. We pray together, we sing together, we hear God's word together, and then Monday through Saturday, we kind of do what we want. Sorry. Or we live a life that's so different versus this idea that we are to approach this throne of grace every day to help us in our time of need. What is that time of need? It's every day. Every day. Every day we should confess. Every day we should turn to the high priest. And every day to hear a word that's from the high priest who says, Your sins are forgiven. Live a life with me. Don't hide. Don't turn away. But let us come together. And then we'll find out, number five, we can have rest not because of our efforts, but because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. We have a high priest, after all, who sacrificed himself for us while we were yet sinners. We have a high priest who in that great moment upon the cross when he is the Lamb of God who sacrifices for the sins of the world says these words, it 
is finished. It is finished. I think about especially my mother in a time like this. My mother had some levels of anxiety. Not surprising. She was born in 1941. Her first years are when she's living in the Netherlands and under, under occupation of Nazi Germany. One of the things that we did together with my mom, especially in the last month of her life, is we gave her a little book, the Heidelberg Catechism. I just encouraged her and my dad, when they were living with that kind of moment, just read and reread and reread Hebrew Heidelberg Catechism, question answer one. What is your only comfort in life and in death that I am not my own belong body and soul to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? In part, because when Jesus says it's finished, he also says, in effect, you can belong to me because I can hold you. You don't have to struggle anymore. And so I do think about the fact that so much of our life is about struggle. And Jesus says, come to me. Don't hide. Don't turn away. Whatever God is putting upon your heart, share with him. Share with the throne of God above. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for your love for us, your care for us and desire once again to hold us. As we think about this moment and this time, we pray, Lord, that you will, again, be near to us and help us to understand the power of grace. In Jesus we pray. Amen.